Hello there, everyone. My name is Christopher Masinski. I'm an assistant professor here at Syracuse, and this semester I'll be teaching this course CIS 352. This is our undergraduate programming languages course here at Syracuse University. I'm going to cover sort of my main objective with the course. Whenever you design a course, you always want to be thoughtful about what is the kind of main thing you want students to get out of the course and how are you going to structure your content to achieve that. I'll talk about that for a while. Um, I'm also going to talk about some logistics, some course delivery. The course will be a sort of flipped classroom style. There will be some video lectures that you'll watch, much of them taken from last semester. We're also coming up with about sort of 40% new content is kind of what we're aiming for. But a lot of the videos will be copied over from last semester, and we'll discuss kind of how that's going to work. Uh, then we're going to go over some reminders about the syllabus. I'll point you to it, and I'll let you read through that on your own. I'll talk a little bit about projects and also a little bit about how exam grading is going to work. Exams are fairly non-standard in this class. Uh, we're trying to structure them so that you can get a higher grade by having multiple attempts on the exam. So please do uh, pay special attention to the, how that grading is going to work. Uh, and then I'm going to wrap up by talking about some course FAQs uh, and I'll sort of mention some other stuff along the way. All right, so whenever you design a course, you always have to ask yourself, what's the main course objective that I have? What is the main thing that I'm really looking for students to get out of the course? And once you choose that, uh, a lot of the rest of the course pieces kind of fall in place. And so uh, this semester, and for the past few semesters when I've taught this course, really I've focused on the, the sort of following high-level course objective, which is that we really want you to be able to write completely correct code that you can very precisely understand and you can easily explain to somebody else or when you go back to read it for yourself. Now, we're going to do things fairly differently in this class than some of your other classes. A lot of the decisions in this class are driven around getting you to understand something completely. Uh, when I was learning to program, you know, I always had this problem where my programs would work pretty much correctly, but then there would also be a lot of behavior that was unintended that ended up crashing the program in weird circumstances. And that led me to a lot of insecurity about the way that I would use sort of programming languages. And so as we learn programming languages this semester, we're going to place a special focus on how do we precisely understand kind of everything about the language. Now we're going to do this in a few separate ways. The first is we're going to have five separate projects that you're going to work on. They're all going to be projects coded up in Racket. Um, so they're fairly substantial amounts of code. The first one, uh, maybe first two are not really so bad, but then they start to build up to being more and uh, more elaborate as the course goes on. And by the end of the course, you'll be writing uh, fairly advanced, sort of interesting programs that are also a decent amount of size on the order of uh, hundreds of lines of code. So this is not a software engineering class. We're not really trying to get you to focus on writing multi-thousand line of code developments. And because of that, we haven't really structured the course to accommodate that very well. Um, instead, we're really hoping that you'll understand programs on the order of hundreds of lines in a language that you can completely explain, but then the programs are going to be completely correct in the sense that they'll have no bugs. Now we're also going to assess written skills via exam questions. Uh, I have a special kind of format for how we're going to do exams this semester, so please stick around for that. That's a little bit later in the video. All right, so a few logistics. Uh, this course is going to be run in this so-called flipped classroom style. What that means is that you're going to be watching a video every week, actually a few videos every week. We try to keep it to less than 80 minutes of required content every week. That being said, we will occasionally have time where we have optional extra lectures, either that we'll give for participation credit or that we'll just give to sort of help students sort of farther along on certain tasks that are going to be optional and you can watch whenever you have time. Now, we do expect you to have watched the videos before lecture. Um, we're going to actually be going over the videos a lot. We're going to be working over with some examples from the slides and the videos. Uh, and so it's going to be very important that you have the, the lectures actually at least watch through one or two passes before you attend the lecture. And then maybe afterwards you'll go over the videos again and you'll sort of refresh yourself on certain content that maybe you realized you missed. Uh, and because uh, we're going to have the lectures informed by the videos, we're actually going to have participation quizzes on them. And so you'll have the opportunity to get uh, one or two participation points for each lecture, so depending on, uh, depending on the lecture. And the last thing is that I use Slack for pretty much everything in the course. When it actually comes to running the course, I'm always using Slack. Um, for better or for worse, we're using a few different platforms in the course. It's not the case that everything's on Blackboard. I pretty much always put my stuff on Slack. We put grades in Blackboard, and then we have projects graded on the autograder. 
Now, there are three instructors for this course. Uh, I am the lead instructor who's actually going to be teaching most of the material. Uh, I'm Assistant Professor Christopher Masinski. I work in programming languages here at uh, Syracuse University. I also have some interests in security and other kind of related fields. And then we also have uh, Davis Silverman, who's a PhD student at Syracuse University, and Chang Liu, who's a master's student at Syracuse University. They're going to be TAs for this course. Uh, they're going to be really good resources to actually help learn the material, to help uh, sort of work on you know, as you're working through projects and things like that, as you watch the videos and you have parts that you don't understand. I'm very happy to give you answers all the time about uh, sort of various things, but it might be really helpful to get somebody else's perspective uh, who's just kind of following along with the material and, you know, isn't the kind of person who generated it. And so uh, I'm really hoping that you'll lean on Davis and Chang as you're kind of working through the projects, as you're watching the videos, as you're sort of studying for exams and that kind of thing. Okay, so the most up-to-date syllabus is always available at this link. The course website is kmasinski.com slash cis352-s22, and then dash syllabus actually gives you the syllabus. There's some really important notes there. I'm not going to go through all of them right now, but I'm hoping you'll read them. Um, there are some important notes about, for example, uh, what to do if you're looking for student accommodations, um, various things like that. And I really encourage you to go check it out and give it a read. All right, and then specifically I'll say the syllabus has a really helpful grade calculator. If you're unsure of how to calculate your actual grade, you can use the grade calculator on the website. That's roughly what we're going to use for actually assigning final grades. Okay, so the course has several projects. The projects do have deadlines. The deadlines will generally be about 12 days from when they're assigned. The uh, projects will be graded on an autograder. The URL is https and then autograder.org. So it's just autograder.org. You should go there. You'll get credentials probably from Chang, one of the TAs. He'll send those to everyone probably on Slack or your email sometime early in the first week of class. So log in, make sure that you can actually uh, you know, check it out and make sure that when you're ready, we'll be able to see the first project. Now, we try to make the projects actually sync up with the material presented at the corresponding time in the course. So it should be the case that, for example, on project uh, two, which is the page rank project, you should be using lots of folds, for example, which is something that we discuss explicitly around that time of the course. So a lot of the material that we're discussing in class is really meant to help you understand how to approach and do the projects. But of course, projects have their own challenges and it is important that you start early so that you can work on those and get help from us as you kind of need it. Now, projects are graded on a percent scale. Each project has some number of tests. Those tests are uh, either public tests, which you have access to, you can read the test cases, and some of them are hidden or secret tests. You actually can't see those test cases. You'll just see whether the test passed or whether it failed based on what your code output, and occasionally you'll get actual output from your code. Now, the grade of your project is assigned based on the number of those questions or those uh, tests you got either passed or failed, and then they'll sort of cumulatively sum up. Projects are always due at 11 p.m. or 11.59 p.m. Syracuse time. So that's going to be basically midnight. Um, up to 72 hours past the project's normal deadline, you can turn in the project and you'll get a 15% penalty. So whatever grade you get will get multiplied by 0.85. All right. And then up to the end of the course, you'll get a 25% penalty on whatever project you turn in. So you should always be able to get a 75% on some project, even if you turn it in, say, extra late. Um, and so, you know, there should be some ability to bring your grade up in the projects, even if you do get a little bit behind. But it is also very important that you stay on top of things because projects sort of cumulatively build on each other. And I've noticed in the past um, that, you know, pacing is very important for students as they go through the course. Now, there are going to be four so-called quizzes and one final. The quizzes are going to take the entire class time because the course has the flipped classroom sort of format. Most of the instruction is going to be done via videos. We're going to do some live coding and questions in class. But then quizzes are going to be in person. You're going to have the opportunity to take some number of questions. Now, there are 12 exam questions through the course that correspond to these things called learning objectives. You can go read about them on the website. But basically, it means this. It's like we took five versions of the final exam and we gave it to you at every point. And you could always boost your grade to be whatever the highest grade was on all of those questions. 
Now we can't give you the final exam after three or four weeks in the course because you'll only have seen three or four topics. But the first exam will have three or four questions on it. And then you'll be able to retake those same questions again on the second quiz. Now you'll be able to answer at most six questions per quiz. So let's say you get three questions right on the first quiz, but you missed the fourth. Well, in the second one, it'll have all of those same questions plus a few new ones from new material we've seen since that quiz. You'll be able to raise your grade on previous questions you took on the first quiz and then also answer these new ones on the second quiz. And if you think about this, what it means is that for question one, which is the material presented right in the beginning of the course, you'll have five separate opportunities to get up to 100% on that question. You can always keep raising your grade. And then um, by the end of the course, you should see every question at least twice. That's kind of our goal. Probably realistically, that will be what will happen. And so some of the later topics, you'll only have the chance to see uh, probably twice or so. But many of the earlier topics, you'll be able to take sort of as many times or up to five times. And that'll hopefully give you a lot of chance to get those earlier topics sort of locked down so that then you can focus on sort of later things in the course. And then your final exam grade is just the average of your grade on all these 12 questions. Now, there are also these things called participation points. There's going to be a participation point awarded for every time you score greater than 50% on a participation quiz or really greater than equal to 50%. So if there are two questions on the participation quiz about the video, generally they're kind of, uh, you know, multiple choice questions that are hopefully not too hard. As long as you get one or two of those right, you'll get a participation quiz or you'll get a participation point. And if you get fewer than 20 of these participation points, and remember, there's at least one per lecture. There are a few other ways to get them in the syllabus that you can read as well. But if you get less than 20 of them, you get a minus applied to your grade. So if you did get an A, you now get an A minus if you have fewer than 20 participation points. If you have between 20 and 30 participation points, then you will not have any change to your grade. But if you get more than 30 participation points or greater than or equal to 30 participation points, you'll actually get a plus. And so this incentivizes you to do 30 points worth of participation. And I won't give extra uh, credit past the 30 points. I kind of think that uh, I've sort of had students ask me about that in the past. And my feeling is really once you have 30 participation points, you're better off focusing on other parts of the course. But uh, I do want to encourage students to participate, especially to uh, take the participation quizzes. All right, so now I want to cover a few frequently asked questions I get about the course. So the first and kind of biggest one that I get is students saying, why teach racket in the course? Racket is kind of a useless language in industry. And, uh, you know, wouldn't it be better to cover something like C++ or Java or JavaScript or Rust or something like that? And uh, I would say that it is true. Uh, racket is not a useful language to learn if your goal is to go take the language you're learning and then use it in industry. I wouldn't argue that it is. But Racket has the essential components of many uh, sort of functional languages that really are used in industry. And understanding Racket is something that you can actually do completely. Unlike, for example, C++, if you want to understand the C++ language, the real standard for it is thousands of pages long. It's even hard to find printed copies. They really only exist in PDF now. I sort of looked around recently. Um, and it's just, it's so hard to understand a modern industrial language that it would be silly to think that you could even try to completely understand it in a single course. You would really have to take a few courses dedicated to it. Now, of course, you could understand the basics and really most important aspects of one of these particular languages, but then you would really have to structure the course around teaching that language in a really deep way. And it's hard to do that while teaching completely some of the other important topics that we really want to get through in the course. Although I will explicitly point out code in some other languages, particularly C++, occasionally Java, um, where I do think that there's relevant insight, there are, for example, places like how call stacks get sort of organized on the computer's actual RAM. That kind of stuff I think is very interesting, and I do actually cover that in some of the lectures because I think that there is a need to uh, sort of address and fill that gap between Racket and C++ occasionally. So another question I get is why not start with type theory? Uh, and so. Type theory is a great way to design a course on programming languages. Uh, and our intro course, which is CIS 252, teaches Haskell. And that's a strongly typed language that has algebraic data types. Uh, in this course, we're actually trying to do something a little bit closer to operationalizing a language. We want to say precisely how it runs. And we really do want to be able to account for things like runtime errors and talk about what really the program means as it executes with respect to its lower level features. And so we will actually build up to type theory and sort 
of how you can do proofs as programs towards the very end of the course. But a lot of the course really for better or for worse really is meant to focus on this interpreter style. And then the other question I get is sort of why the emphasis on functional programming and disallowing, for example, set bang or mutability. And I would sort of say functional programming just is simpler. It's a much more restrictive framework. That's why it's kind of hard to write some things that would be very natural to write using loops, for example. And I think it's an important and relevant thing to sort of think about functional programming in a very sort of um, concentrated way and learn it really well once, especially in these types of courses. Because then in practice, when you go out and you get your job and you're doing programming in something like Java or something like that, you can stick to a fairly pure style and get really nice clean code that you can reason about compositionally. And you'll know precisely when you need to be adding in statefulness. And it will really radically reduce the complexity of your programs in a way that I think will really benefit you. So even if you do later on go do sort of something that's not functional programming, I really do hope that those principles will sort of be carried forward into your career. All right, well, thanks so much. I'm really excited to get started working on projects with you, and I'm really hoping that you have fun in the course. If you have any questions about it, please feel free to let me or the TAs know. This is one of our favorite courses to teach here at SU, and so I'm really hoping it's gonna be a great semester. I'll see you around in class. Thanks so much, bye.